Britain. It is an immense pleasure to welcome you all back to the session. Um, having had the, the, the excellent uh, uh, insights from the minister, uh, we're now diving into some of the, uh, the nitty gritty of a subject that is very dear to my heart. Um, Africa's had a fantastic decade and a half. If you look at average growth rates across sub-Saharan Africa of about 7%, um, you know, we, we've seen per capita incomes over that period doubling. Um, you know, we've seen huge numbers of people being lifted out of poverty, but we've also seen uh, a deep slowdown uh, in this economic growth rate. And, and the great decade we had in terms of democratic progress, uh, more elections happening in more places, uh, may be faltering if one looks at some of the countries. Um, and, and one has to say, you know, what, uh, and a question that I keep asking, and I'm, and I'm hoping to get some answers here, a question that I've been asking, whether I travel from, you know, through Nigeria, through uh, South Africa, various, uh, various other uh, mineral economies on this continent, is simply, what, sort of, what more could be done? What uh, opportunities are we missing to maximize the potential of these economies? Um, and, and in terms of that question, uh, we have an excellent panel of speakers. I'll introduce them uh, as, as they're about to come up. Uh, but once again, a you, you, uh, great pleasure to invite Bruce back to, the, back to the podium, Executive Head of Strategy at the De Beers Group, to talk a bit more about uh, maximizing the, uh, the output of uh, resource economies. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so many of us are going to talk in different ways around the question of what more can be done. I think from our point of view as De Beers, maybe the place to start is to uh, lay out our view of the framework that was laid and why the particular framework with, we, with which we have had so much to do has been a, such a tremendous success in, in Botswana. Um, as you know, and as we've, we've, we often say, we as De Beers are very proud of the success of the partnership. Uh, and so it's a privilege for us to be involved in, in these discussions. I'll talk a little bit about what we think has helped this partnership be successful, because I think the building blocks of this are fundamentally important for the debate about the future. But it is important at the outset to say two things. One is we, of course, don't pretend to and couldn't possibly have all the answers. Um, and these are crunchy questions that will require tremendous debate. And secondly, of course, and I think we've heard some very interesting questions already for the minister along these lines, is uh, there probably is not a one-size-fits-all solution for all um, challenges. I think there are common ingredients in solutions, but I don't think you can take a blueprint of one solution and impose it anywhere else. Um, one of the reasons I say this, of course, is that the diamond industry has some structural factors which are not really seen in other industries. For example, over time, the growth in demand should outstrip the growth in supply, certainly in normal trading conditions. Um, and I think that does make a bit of a difference. We, we recognize that Botswana, as one of the world's largest diamond producers, and De Beers with leading value chain activities across the value chains, are probably not typical partners um, in PPPs. But we do think there's several lessons in this partnership that could be useful uh, in, in all countries and in other industries. So as I say, we don't profess to think we have a magic formula for PPP success. But we do think we qualified after nearly 50 years in partnership to have some interesting insights on the question. We would say that the following are the four most fundamental areas in relation to the success of the PPP. The first one is governance. The second one is political stability. The third one is the sound investment of resource generated wealth. And the fourth one is shared long term commitment. We've heard a lot about governance already. But in general senses for us, this means each party playing an effective and responsible role in managing its side of the partnership. Government being focused on meeting its national, social, and economic objectives. The private corporation focused on creating commercial value and opportunity within the sector. That can give rise to an effective allocation of roles. Business does not look to influence government policy too unduly, and government does not look to influence corporate strategy too unduly. Clearly, there's influence and debate there, but not overly so. In a more specific sense, this means, in our case, having effective oversight of all the corporate structures in our partnership. So in our two JVs, we have established with the government for both mining and sorting and valuing, we have boards of directors comprised of equal numbers of members from each party in the partnership. 
This means the, partners, the partners must consider shared objectives for the JV. So this focuses the mind on what each party really wants out of the relationship and helps both parties understand the other's views and concerns. Also, because of the structure, there is equal responsibility for achieving these objectives. Communication is more formalized, and the risk of one party experiencing discontent with another's approach is minimized because of constant engagement. Political stability. This is, I guess, an obvious one, but it is important for a number of reasons, including the predictability of the regulatory regime, security of tenure for the investor, physical security of the assets of the corporation, and very importantly, consistency of policy to promote and support the activity. When any foreign investor is considering committing to spending very substantial sums of capital in a country, it will only really do so if it has real security of tenure. This is especially the case in an industry such as diamond mining because, as you know, it takes a considerable length of time for mines to be developed. So you start spending considerable sums of capital many, many years before you see the financial returns on those. And so uh, stability from that point of view is critical. Industry also looks for predictability in regulation. If government keeps changing the goalposts in which business operates, this can create major commercial challenges that can distract from the core business, inhibit short-term commercial success and long-term development opportunities. Stability in the political climate also supports the security of the investor. Knowing that there is a stable democracy with a very strong rule of law facilitates a greater appetite for investment and a greater appetite for risk as assets are protected and foreign experts are much, much more inclined to come and operate locally. Consistency of policy also enables businesses to be confident in the likely future climate. Past performance is usually viewed as a good indicator of future performance. So companies, again, are more likely to commit major capital expenditure when they perceive low risk of changing policy decisions that might harm their investment decisions. The investment of resource-generated wealth. Performance will only be maximized where the revenues from mineral extraction are effectively invested in supporting the industry's domestic future. Th investment in things like education and training are absolutely key to ensure that the right type of workforce is developed and advanced to meet the future needs and the future profile of jobs that will be created. So investment in the local enabling environment helps make the local sectors much more efficient. Investment in infrastructure helps society, but also, of course, supports the activity of the businesses concerned. Investment in the creation of industrial hubs helps to maximize the local supply chain benefits of the industrial activity. Investment in healthcare is yet another important place. Debswana was the first company in Botswana to provide free antiretroviral treatments for its employees and their families. And this made sense from a social point of view, from a government point of view, and obviously from a company and commercial point of view. Investment in enterprise development can also help create more businesses of the future that will support the domestic industry. And this is where mining companies, um, particularly like ourselves, can make a tremendous contribution because there are many, many spin-off jobs from the mining industry uh, which uh, can flow from wise investment in enterprise development. And lastly, investment in downstream linkage opportunities can certainly help diversify the economy. The last of our four key areas is shared long-term commitment. Now, obviously, this will enable the relationship to flourish, to grow, and to solidify over time. And there are some examples of this in our partnership with the government of Botswana. The GRB has a direct 15% shareholding in De Beers itself, reinforcing again that what is good for De Beers is good for Botswana, and what is good for Botswana is good for De Beers. As you've heard, we recently relocated our multi-billion dollar global international sales operation from London in one of the biggest transfers of economic activity from north to south and did that very successfully. So we have found ways in the partnership to ensure our objectives are aligned and codified uh, in some of our agreements, particularly in our more recent, uh, our longest sales agreement. But I think the importance of shared commitment over the long term simply cannot be overstated. In any lasting partnership, finding points of common interest and shared goals 
is crucial. Without this, the parties in the relationship will start to move in different directions and the strength of the partnership bond will be undone. And that is why really, perhaps most of all, engagement, communication and trust are so important. So throughout the nearly 50 years of our partnership, De Beers and Botswana have ensured that engagement levels remain high, helping each party to understand where there are shared objectives and also to understand where, as often happens, there are different objectives. This has enabled a mature discussion about how to develop strategies that are mutually acceptable in spite of some differences in long-term goals. And while the diamond industry is perhaps more focused on the long-term than others, after all, a diamond is forever, this focus on long-term commitment is likely to be beneficial, we would think, to any PPP. A government partner can, of course, legitimately be expected to want to see revenues and economic opportunities over a long-term period, as this maximizes the opportunity for development, not just directly via the industry in question, but also by, via supporting and spin-off industries that benefit from the presence of a foreign investor. The longer that the, that the foreign investor is in town, the longer the horizon over which local businesses can establish fruitful relationships with them. And on the other hand, any business is likely to want to maximize the duration of their exposure to the raw materials on which their commercial activities depend. So this provides a stable platform on which long-term strategies can be developed, as well as greater certainty around re achieving returns on investment. So in conclusion, Whilst our approach may not necessarily provide a perfect prototype for every PPP, and indeed it won't, I hope I've been able to give you a sense of how we at De Beers feel are some of the, higher, the more important issues at a higher level that are important to get right. And as with so many things in life, much of our shared success comes down to a balance, creating well-balanced strategies that will enable each party to meet their overall objectives, Balancing the importance of meeting short-term targets with the need to stimulate long-term development and developing effectively balanced governance structures inside formalized structures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, I have to tender a small apology. I had uh, very few responsibilities as chairman of the session and uh, very clear instructions on what to do, and they included a, 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 a very brief set of housekeeping uh, 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 reminders, uh, and unfortunately, in my excitement to hear the speakers, I completely forgot, so please forgive me for that. Um, the, the, I suppose the housekeeping is just um, a reminder that this is an on-the-record session. The, the, the so-called Chatham House rule does not apply. Everything that is said here uh, can be used and can be attributed. Um, uh, I'm going to ask you to also put your phones on silent. Please don't, don't make the mistake that I've made in the past of, uh, of, of, of ruining a conference for everyone else by having your phone ring. And uh, lastly, in fact, if, 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 while looking to check that your phone is on silent, if you can't find it, uh, someone has lost a phone, and that's been handed in to, uh, to Chris, who is uh, on the side here. He's at the back. So if, uh, if, if trying to turn your phone off, uh, you can't. Please, please go and find uh, find Chris. Um, now back to back to the uh, the, the exciting stuff. Uh, great pleasure to to, to invite uh, Katso Tripinare, an economist at uh, Barclays Bank, to take the podium. Thank you. Um, all protocol observed. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, the financial and economic crisis exposed one of the major weaknesses for a number of African economies. That is their dependence on too few export commodities or on one or two sectors of the economy. Such dependence make many countries vulnerable to fluctuations in commodity prices, demand, and extreme weather conditions such as droughts and floods. For more than a decade, some African countries have been enjoying high levels of economic growth, human capital development, and political stability. As they continue along that path of economic progress, it is imperative that they find ways to diversify their economies 
by boosting non-traditional sectors, expanding their range of products and exports, and engaging with new economic and development partners. A number of factors are creating an urgent need for Botswana to move away from diamond-centric to diversified economy that can support a broad array of industries and provide income-generating opportunities for businesses. The diamond and price, the demand and price of diamond have begun to level off, thus depressing the national budget. At the same time, the cost of expanding public workforce will absor absorb large portions of this budget, leading to deficits which could undermine economic diversification efforts by crowding out investment in infrastructure and development industries. Building a diversified economy strategy does not occur in a vacuum. There needs to be a enabling environment to make diversification possible. A number of key drivers have been identified, such as investment, trade and policy, industrial policy, a dynamic growth performance, microeconomic stability, a comp competitive exchange rate, and expansionary but responsible fiscal policy, and industrial variables like good governance, absence of conflict, and low levels of corruption. Similarly, regional economic situations, institutions rather, such as the Southern African Development Community, SADC, and the Southern African Customs Union, SACU, in case of Botswana and other international partners can help contribute to economic priorities, including through boosting the public sector's capacity to implement policies and reforms conducive to diversification. Despite a number of policies, institutions, strategies, and incentive schemes implemented by government to diversify the economy over the years, Botswana remain heavily dependent on the mineral sector more especially the diamond mining. This remains a big challenge for policymakers and researchers alike. However, it is widely acknowledged in the literature that less enabling environment or not fully supportive framework for the policies adopted might compromise the progress of diversification. So the main purpose of this address is to suggest few key actions that can be considered to build robust and diversified economic strategy. Number one, action number one, is to build mutually beneficial partnership between the private and public sector to create initiatives geared towards achieving national goals and to foster implementation of these initiatives. The private sector has an important role to play in its own right and in conjunction with the public sector. Shifting away from public sector to private sector employment cannot be an easy exercise, arguably. There are certain sacrifices that are to be made if this goal is to be achieved. In many occasions, especially in developing countries, government is the biggest employer. Most employees prefer to work in the public sector, mainly because of job security. The challenge of reducing government budgets and creating a diversified economy will require measures to reduce public sector workforce and to make private sector employment attractive and secure. Action number two, encourage economic diversification through competition and innovation. Usually governments create jobs that cannot be sustained without continued subsidies or government interventions. Instead, governments should focus on creating a business environment that facilitates private sector growth over the long term. Each nation obviously should pursue policies suited to its own political, economic, and cultural institutions, but an effective strategy will at least include the following three elements. A, deeper analysis to identify and prioritize promising industries for innovation and growth much less resources and effort is needed to give a competitive edge to most promising and responsive companies in the economy. B, investment in entrepreneurship, research, and innovation. The government of Botswana is doing well by making such investment like providing seed capital to help entrepreneurs start businesses or 
on a larger scale through infrastructure development to create innovation hubs. C, a plan to start locally and to expand globally. The government can focus initial efforts on enabling a competitive business environment that yield national champion companies and the local market. And with this foundation, these businesses can begin to compete more profitably in the regional and global markets. Action number three, attract and train the national workforce for entrepreneurship and private sector employment. The effort to provide private sector employment should be developed in concert with initiatives to promote private sector growth. However, for private sector jobs that can generate the desired pay and benefit, special skills and knowledge are needed. Consequently, as the government moves to stimulate targeted sectors, it should also support education and training initiatives to provide much needed skills for these sectors. Such initiatives are most effective when planned and implemented with input from the private sector to ensure that education and training are aligned with industrial workforce needs. Action number four, to test, measure, and evaluate the impact of policy initiatives before and during implementation. The implementation of the right policy initiatives and achieving the desired outcome require rigorous analysis and objective fact-based decision making. Even before the new initiatives are implemented, the government can use a number of tools to evaluate their potential impact. For example, strategic simulation can help test new ideas and access risk-reward trade-offs. Simulation can also be used to bring together knowledgeable stakeholders to replicate or model anticipated decisions in the future and evaluate anticipated outcomes in advance. In particular, participants can identify unforeseen problems and develop practical solutions for how to address challenges. Pilot programs can also be used to test and uh, refine initiatives before committing significant resources to them. Once initiatives are implemented, the public and private sector institutions should measure and evaluate the effectiveness of the programs. The strategic simulations held before implementation can help identify the appropriate measures and targeted outcomes. Effective measures require participating institutions to put in place information systems and processes for collecting, sharing, and analyzing the data. Decision support systems can provide significant long-term payoffs in guiding modernization efforts and putting programs on the right track from the onset. Such efforts will provide government and business leaders with the information they need to make fact-based decisions in designing and implementing national economic strategy. The national development plans outline national goals and with varying de details lay out strategies for achieving those goals. By objectively measuring progress, the government can assess the effectiveness of their efforts, make mid cost adjustment and necessary and ensure accountability among those tasked with responsibilities. It should be noted that introducing introduction of metrics and measuring processes sometimes meet with resistance because people fear that, fear that they, the measures will be used to find faults and punish them. Consequently, leaders should strive to use metrics as a guide to help people achieve goals, emphasizing their accountability, recognizes, and reward achievement. Ultimately, success depends on accountability. The last action, number five, communication. The public and the private sector should equally strive to improve communication, not only with each other, but also with other citizens. Ultimately, success depends on national citizens embracing national economic and workforce development programs. A persuasive communication plan will help citizens understand their national economic vision and plan. Among its key messages are 
The long-term economic success requires strong and diversified private sector economies, personal responsibility, accountability, and striving for excellence are essential for both individual and national success. Government and their people have a strong foundation upon which to seize opportunities for innovation and growth. Government and businesses are investing in infrastructure training, education, and other areas to help their people to succeed. Achieving national aspiration will depend on the support and buy-in of national citizens. Therefore, effective communication will require sensitive uh, attention to cultural norms and expectations regarding the workforce and the economic activity. Transparency and dialogue are essential for success. Conclusion. A strong, growing, sustainable, and diversified economy is the goal of every nation in the world. A diversified and sustainable economy enhances a nation's plan, nation's standard of living rather, by creating wealth and jobs, encouraging the development of new knowledge and technology, and help to ensure a stable political climate. However, the transition from a diamond-centric to a diversified economy is a complex undertaking. It requires changes in regulatory policies, business structures, and education and training. No single government agency can or private sector organization can carry, out, uh, can carry it out on its own. Achieving this ambitious goal will require the collaborative effort of all stakeholders. Governments should take a leading role in convening and guiding the stakeholders, but ultimate success will depend on how well all interested parties work together. Even then, it won't be enough simply to generate new ideas and formulate a general strategy. The most important challenge will be designing access and successfully implementing, implementing a long-term plan for carrying out the strategy. This will require close cooperation among ministries and stakeholders within government, as well as between government and the private sector as they collaborate in drafting practical solutions, creating systems to measure progress, establishing mechanisms for resolving conflict, and addressing the inevitable challenges that will arise, and using fact-based decisions making to move forward along the chosen path. In this way, government can tap into the existing strengths and resources, particularly the talent of their people, to build a thriving and resilient economy that supports expanded employment, sustains long-term growth, and solidifies the role in the global economy. I thank you. Thank you very much, Kat. So our, our next speaker is uh, Dorothea uh, Gizenga, who's the executive director of the Diamond Development Initiative. Dorothea. Good morning, everyone. All protocols observed. Thank you. So my topic is uh, stakeholder engagement, social stakeholders. And I feel like uh, Botswana already does that very well, but it doesn't hurt to repeat some of the essential elements of such a topic. Stakeholder engagement has evolved from a marginal concern to a driving force for businesses and governments, and even for NGOs. An important prerequisite before engaging with stakeholders is gathering intelligence on social, political, cultural, and environmental issues that bear on the business of the organization, the government, or the business. Particularly when it comes to resource management, and in this case, diversification of it. These issues pose potential risk and represent significant opportunities at the same time. So it is important to understand the gathered issues that have been collected, and what is needed for that is an open, inquisitive, and feedback-rich relationship with stakeholders, 
well-resourced and effective mechanisms for sensing, analyzing, and interpreting what is going on, and an internal culture that is receptive to early signals of threat and opportunity. Correct identification of stakeholders is critical. The stakeholders to be involved must reflect the existing complexity of the social issues associated, associated to the change that diversification and resource management represent. The resource management on its own and diversification include trade-offs, and we need to be aware of that. So public understanding of those trade-offs are very important in order to gain some credibility and some degree of public support for long-term diversification on decision-making. Diversification is best driven through the private sector. And so it's important to enhance opportunities for, for citizens' involvement in uh, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial aspects of private sector development so that they are part of that. Literacy, language, culture, and access can pose obstacles to effective engagement of citizens and of stakeholders. And that emphasizes the need for a strategy and a core competence in stakeholder engagement. So developing a core competence in stakeholder engagement and working regularly with panels of stakeholders on key issues is an advisable business and government strategy. Despite these limitations, it is important to also include social media because we'll get the impression that because there is literacy issues and others that we cannot engage social media networks and tools for stakeholder engagement. For those stakeholders that have the ability to use the tools, they can influence other stakeholders that don't have that access and ability who are their relatives and friends. The most important aspect of stakeholder engagement is communication, and I think my previous speaker uh, quite emphasized that point in, term, in terms of public-private uh, strategy. Because the reputation is created through a combination of stakeholders' experiences, corporate messaging, and the broader media conversation about business and specific companies. So mechanisms such as social reporting and third party audits can lend, lend credibility and transparency to corporate claims about social and environmental performance. And we do have a report that we have received from the beers that illustrates specifically this particular point. What is also important is to ensure that the communication is stakeholder driven and it, there is a need for less of a one-way communication and more for a two-way communication. So those are the aspects that of, this, um, of the stakeholder engagement that I sought to reiterate, taking into account that the government of Botswana does quite a bit of uh, good stakeholder engagement already. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Keith Jeffries, who is uh, the Managing Director of eConsult, and he's a former Deputy Governor of the Bank of Botswana. Uh, Keith. Thanks very much. Um, I've been asked to talk on the topic of legislating for development. I, I'm going to interpret that a bit broadly uh, in terms of legislation legal and policy frameworks. Interestingly, um, we, the, the four of us up here, we didn't coordinate at all about the contents of our presentations, but I think you'll see that the points I'm going to make actually complement quite well what the, the other presenters have said. Um, so I'm going to 
talk about four areas of the legal and policy framework in the context of a resource economy. I'll talk briefly about what the objectives should be of the legal and policy framework. I'll talk about what the characteristics of such a desirable framework should look like, um, what, the, what the components of that framework are in the context of a resource economy, and then I'll, at the end I'll talk about what I think of Botswana's strengths and weaknesses in this area. So, in terms of the objectives of the policy and legal framework in a resource economy, I think the primary objective should be to maximize the long-term benefits of exploiting natural resources, and I emphasize long-term benefits. And this involves, firstly, attracting investment. If there's no investment, there's no industry. So it's very important to attract investment into resource development, and that is both public investment uh, from government and private investment from the private sector, and the private sector may be domestic, it may be foreign. I don't think any type of investment should be ruled in and, or ruled out, um, but the framework should be broad enough to attract foreign, domestic, public, private in investment. The benefits which should be maximized over a period of time, the economic benefits include employment, um, the balance of payments, the impact on the balance of payments, which is essentially export earnings, um, fiscal revenues, the revenues flowing to the government from the resource sector, and the contribution of the sector to GDP, to output. And those benefits, of course, may be direct in terms of the direct activities of mining companies, or may be indirect in terms of the value chain. The final objective, sorry, not the final, the third objective should be to make sure that the industry is sustainable. So it should have a long-term focus. There's no point in focusing on short-term um, uh, gains. Um, negative environmental impacts should be minimized. Obviously, this is in terms of sustainability. Building on what Dorothy has said, I think it's extremely important that public support and understanding is built. And finally, the industry should be a good global citizen. It's not just about sustainability in the Botswana context, but it's in the global context as well. And then finally, the objective of the policy framework in a resource economy, somewhat, somewhat ironically, the policy sh framework should also support the transition to not being a resource economy. As we know, resources are finite, and one day they'll run out. The economy still needs to run on the basis of other economic activities. So the framework should also be supportive of that transition. So what would a, a, a good legal and policy framework look like in terms of its characteristics? Firstly, it should be based on broad national interests and not narrow sectional interests. It should be evidence-based and analytically supported. In other words, it should have a sound foundation. As I've said, it should have a long-term time horizon, not short-term. It should also aspire to set or be in line with best practice internationally. <coughs> I've said it should be stable, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't change. It should be stable over time, but should evolve as circumstances and evidence change. And where change is undertaken in the policy framework, they should be based on and involve broad-based consultations. In terms of how um, investors are treated, I think the policy framework should aspire as far as possible to be consistent across firms and across minerals. In other words, firms should be treated by and large in the same way, regardless of who they are. So avoid, for instance, individual deals with individual companies but set the rules that apply across the board. And finally, the legal and policy framework should be transparent and accountable. So what are the components of such a policy framework? Well, there are many things which apply directly to the resource sector. Um, the direct legislation which applies will be that legislation regarding mineral rights. In Botswana, we have the Mines and Minerals Act, and that governs uh, a wide range of um, areas such as exploration, mining leases, ownership, who can own 
government's entitlement to a share in mining companies, all laid down clearly in the Act and legislation and regulations. Another key area is taxation, whether that be uh, profits tax or royalties, etc., etc., and that is also laid down in the Mines and Minerals Act and the Income Tax Act. A third key area is how those revenues are spent. So it's not just about how revenues are raised from the mining sector, it's about how those mineral revenues are spent by the government. And then uh, uh, another key area is how environmental issues are dealt with. So those are directly relevant to resource investment. There are also a number of indirect elements. So legislation regarding land is crucial and also legislation regarding access to skills, immigration, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not just about the laws that are on the statute book. It's also about the, the legal and policy environment more generally. So property rights may be laid down, but are they secure in practice? Does a country have the rule of law? Are contracts enforceable? And finally, um, how efficient is the administrative system? Um, all laws involve room for interpretation and discretion. So how, how speedy is decision making? and how objective is decision making on the part of government. And finally, um, corruption obviously is, is a big deal um, and uh, the policy and legal framework should as far as possible uh, be, uh, uh, corruption should be absent. So what are the good and bad aspects of Botswana's environment in terms of all these characteristics? I think on the positive side, as everybody knows, uh, Botswana has pretty good rankings on international assessments relating to, relating to the mining policy and the legal environment, whether it's the Fraser Institute uh, results. Botswana does very well, not just in Africa, but internationally um, in terms of corruption, the Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index. Botswana also always does extremely well. Um, I think when one talks to people in the mining sector, Generally, they're very happy with the legal framework. The policy environment is very stable. Um, public officials are high quality and generally very fair. So the way in which mining companies are treated um, is in general uh, very good, both in terms of what's on the statute book and what happens in, in practice. Um, on, the, on the taxation side, I don't think anybody would argue that Botswana is a low taxation jurisdiction for uh, mining companies. The taxation rate is high, but it is consistent and in general it's transparent. The tax rates are laid out in the Mines and Minerals Act and the um, Income Tax Act. Um, and the scope for individual companies to try and strike deals um, is almost zero. The taxation system is structured in such a way that allows private investors a fair return on capital, including an allowance for risk, and as a result, it encourages continued flows of investment. And one of the things I like is a very simple but very flexible income tax formula that doesn't overly tax mining companies, but where there are windfall profits, um, it captures a high proportion of those windfall profits for the government. On the spending side, there's been an important policy rule, which is that all mineral revenues, because they're derived from the depletion of an asset, in other words, minerals in the ground, those mineral revenues are fully devoted to investment in physical capital or human capital or to financial savings. So the idea, the principle is, mineral revenues are not used for consumption, not used to finance um, recurrent expenditure. Um, and that rule has been adhered to over a period of 40 years. And so the, the, the revenues that have been derived from the taxation of the mining sector have either been used to invest in people, human capital, or physical, social and economic infrastructure, um, or to build up financial assets. And policies and public expenditure priorities are laid out in uh, what are called national development plans. Um, which are the, the, the blueprint for government spending over five or, or six year periods. Policy is also focused a lot on diversification. 
Um, and even from the beginning, it's been recognized that the economy does need to diversify. There has also been um, uh, an emphasis on beneficiation of mineral products, but beneficiation has been encouraged without being forced on investors in the industry. So those are the positive aspects, which I think are, are very good. There are some negative aspects, though, that I think that need to be addressed. Um, in line with, with what Dorothy was saying, I think the level of public understanding of mineral sector policies is fairly low in Botswana. Um, just in the context of this recent very large diamond that was found by Lukara, um, the chatter on social media is really based on a, a lack of understanding of how the money that's raised from the sale of that diamond will flow to government. So clearly there is not nearly enough understanding of how mining sector policies work and how revenue and spending work. Um, I mentioned that mineral revenues are spent on investment, but it's a guideline, it's not a law. There's no legal requirement for that to take place. I think also in Botswana, sometimes we can be a bit complacent and policy is slow to change and modernize. While we may have had state-of-the-art best practice policies 30 or 40 years ago, some of our policies are now behind the times because they haven't changed. Just to give an example, and, and this really relates to the transparency side of things. Um, Botswana is not a member of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. And that really sets the standard now, which I think resource economies should aspire to. Botswana is not a member. Um, I think the response from government has always been, no, we're not DRC. We haven't got anything to hide. We don't need to sign up with that club of, of rather shady economies. But of course, the problem is that the EITI standards actually go beyond what Botswana does. So for instance, while we have broad figures on taxes, tax revenues that are raised from mining companies, mining, the mining sector as a whole, we have no idea about what taxes are raised from individual companies. Um, and I think the level of disclosure by mining companies really um, leaves something to be desired. And, and um, in the context of this meeting, I'll, I'll mention some of the discussions I've had with, had with Debswana and De Beers. And one of my concerns is that while Debswana is the largest company in the economy and accounts for 20, 25% of GDP, it doesn't publish any financial statements. It's a private company. It doesn't publish any information on its payments to government. And I don't think, as the largest company in the economy, I don't think that's acceptable. And Debswana should really hold itself accountable to higher standards, just for instance, the standards that would be applicable to any company listed on a major stock exchange. Similarly, details of mining licenses, agreements with mining companies um, are not published. We have uh, there are a whole set of um, agreements between the government and De Beers, um, which are not in the public domain. I think that needs to be um, rethought. So I think we really need to be, we need to do better on the transparency side in terms of building public understanding and also that helps to, um, uh, to support accountability. Just one final comment on diversification. Um, I mentioned, and as others have mentioned, it's been a major part of um, uh, policy for a long period of time and there has been partial success in diversifying the economy. So the mining sector is, not nearly as dominant in GDP as it used to be. Um, and GDP has become much more diversified. But the weakness is that exports have not become more diversified. And so our balance of payments is still incredibly dependent on mining and, and in diamonds in particular. So we've succeeded in diversifying the economy but not export earnings and that clearly has long-term sustainability implications. What we've done is we've diversified into what economists call non-tradables. Um, and the point about non-tradables is, as their name implies, they're not traded internationally and competitiveness is not a big driver of non-tradables. So on the diversification front, yes, we've had some successes, um, but we do need to diversify exports much more than we have up to date and that needs to be done on the basis of competitiveness and productivity. So there's a, the policy framework really needs to focus on that type of diversification, not just uh, diversification for its own sake. Thank you very much.
Under the desk we have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Keith, thank you very much. We, we've got some time for questions. So if you if you'd please direct the questions uh, uh, to us uh, and, and just stating your name and affiliation. Uh, if you do have a question, please do. Bear in mind that we're staring into, into some rather bright lights here, and I'm, I'm somewhat short-sighted, so wave your hands vigorously. We have a question right in the front here. Members of your panel, Ponasawa Kirikiro is my name. I really don't have a question as such, but an appreciation of some of the earlier points made, particularly the opening remarks with respect to thinking outside the box, robust institutions and, the, and challenging the assumptions. Because even what the president had been saying, the president of this republic in terms of delivery of the national address on the state of the nation. You know, there are fundamental issues relating to the good ideas that are coming up in this conference and they've come up before. But the fundamental difficulty I think that we have is lack of coordinated and, and strategic plan and practical implementation and thrust. In 2012, we asked Professor Michael Porter from the Harvard Business School to indicate to us what was lacking with respect to developments, economic developments, and other related developments in Botswana. His simple answer was implementation. And we knew that. And of course, last July, I gave the the group that was preparing particularly for this conference, I gave them a paper that I had cost to be prepared on Botswana's economic development path, 20, rather 1966 to 2016. I shared that with the team when I made my presentation. Now, of course, also accepted that Diamonds had created or had made a major contribution as confirmed by the speakers this morning. But that, obviously, that is not enough. And that, of course, the, the question of the partnership and how useful it has been, that is not really questionable. It's, it's a fact, and it is something that, that, that um, is worth commenting on. My take was, how do we create something equivalent to what the partnership has done so far? Create something that is in keeping with the, with the, the headline or the, 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 the key, the theme, that is the word I was looking for, of connecting resources and society in Botswana. The key, the practical implementation approaches team is what one would hope would come out of this meeting as to what we should do. And then, of course, that relates to the National Planning and Implementation Commission that I hope could be one of the issues that we want to look at in order to to challenge the assumptions, to think outside the box, and to look at the institutions that can now hold and sustain Botswana's economic development by putting together all of the issues that ought to be tackled at this stage of Botswana's development. There was reference to data analysis, and monitoring and evaluation. That is lacking to me, you know, at least in my view. There are major institutional developments like Botswana oil. There is the issue of coal, coal, as opposed to diamonds. There is the issue of the minerals investment company 
that is in place. There are a number of government institutions, including the national, the national strategic, national strategy office. As an institution, I have no quarrel with the individuals, but the institution itself, in terms of Botswana's development now, really doesn't have the capacity, relatively the relevance, to be able to handle the issues at stake at this moment. If Botswana is to, 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 to go a little further forward and not be left behind by the competitors. So I, I appreciate that, you know, in conferences like this, you, it's, one has to be short, but we have to create hope, key, especially for the impatient youth. They have reason to be impatient. In order to bring resources closer to the people, there are a number of steps that, we ought to, or that can be taken. The community projects, to me, are also key. The IT-educated youth can do a job. But how do they deliver, or how do we help the communities to deliver the lives of the Zuswa, the Zuswa project for salt production? How do we revive the Mohobani irrigation scheme? the cooperatives, the wood weavers, just to give you examples. What happened to the DBS great idea of Peu and Tokafar? The trusts around the country, the development of special economic zones, the issues relating to, with respect to all those projects, manufacturing as a long-term development marketing and management systems. We are now embarking on Vision 2036 and its perspectives. The issue is who is going to be coordinating of all of this and ensuring that there is a plan and implementation strategy. Unless we can be able to, from this meeting, influence such that there is a team that will be able to achieve that because for all the indices that we have, and also with respect to investment that domestic and foreign, really we have little to show. And until we do that, until there is this mechanism that can be able to put all of these together and deliver them, and also the mismatch between training and, and the world of work, and also dealing with jobless growth, I yes, I, 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 I stopped like there, but to, all I'm saying like is to, that... Like to allow people to respond to yes, thank you very much. All, I, all I'm saying is that questions. unless there is a mechanism to deliver all of this that we have said and that we are saying now, mm -hmm. it still comes to naught such that our competitive edge and, and, of course, diversification and the rest that we have mentioned will, not, will, will remain undelivered. Thank you. Thank you. Concerns are noted. Thank you. Question next, year, if you. You know, the topic is very interesting in the sense that it talks about maximizing the potential of resource-driven economies. Now, I will direct my comments and questions to doctors Tsipinari and Jeffries. One thing uh, that has been said that is undoubted is that Botswana is a prosperous country. But one concern that emerges is that Botswana remains uncompetitive. The success that we've seen in Botswana is not as a result of competitiveness, productivity, or ability to create employment. How then, uh, considering that Botswana has been a middle-income country for quite some time, do we move the country up to a fully developed status? Thank you. Hello, Carlo Merle, technical advisor to government on civil society engagement. Yes, uh, I think one piece of, of, the, of probably of, uh, of, the, of the cake that is, is missing clearly in Botswana is that accountability you know, to deliver results. Of course, uh, there's uh, been a lot, of, a lot of successes in the past, but the future doesn't look you know, so, so good uh, as the past. So how, 
how can Botswana you know, move towards a, more, uh, a framework that is more accountable to deliver the policies that are, that are there? One piece is clearly that wasn't coming out before is clearly the transparency part, and I totally agree with Dr. Jeffries. Uh, here, Botswana ranks uh, 50 out of 58 success country in the resource governance index about, you know, uh, reporting. Uh, and that cannot, uh, cannot, it's not a good basis, no, in order to achieve any, any, any positive development. In the future, I would like to hear the panel, what are the perspectives uh, in, uh, in Botswana? Are there any initiatives from government or uh, private sector in order to, to move uh, towards a more a transparent uh, a framework. That is the first step towards a, a stronger accountability. And uh, on the other side, how to include uh, better stakeholders. I, I do agree there have been uh, quite successes in the past, but currently, even the fact that there's not much civil society here at this conference doesn't really look like Botswana is a model of stakeholder engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to give the panel each, each a minute and a half to respond. Um, if, if, you, if you would deal with uh, the questions that are relevant to your sectors, I suppose. Uh, so, so if we could start on the far end, Keith. Uh, Thank you. Um, yeah, I think um, I agree with uh, Neo Morocco that um, we, we are prosperous but not competitive. And I think the reason is that we have managed to reach upper middle income status um, with what I call well-managed good luck. Um, but that's not going to keep us prosperous in the future, and, and we do need to move towards an economy based on competitiveness and productivity and efficiency. And um, I think, without uh, much time to go into details, I think the whole competitiveness side of things needs, needs to have a much higher profile in government policy. And it doesn't, unfortunately. I think that it, it's not yet fully factored into the types of decisions the government makes, whether it's to do with the costs of all sorts of um, inputs to production, whether it be labor, um, um, or transport, etc., etc. So I think a much bigger focus on, on competitiveness and driving down costs and raising efficiency, it needs to be, needs to run through the whole of government policy. And I think that while it's there and it is spoken about, it is not yet fully factored into decisions that are taken. Thank you. Would you, would you like to talk about uh, uh, accountability and transparency, perhaps? Yeah. Well, we all recognize that uh, societies do evolve and Botswana is evolving and uh, the stakeholders that either the government or the private sector has today are not the same that are tomorrow. And uh, the stakeholder engagement strategy recognizes precisely that. It does the analysis ahead of time. It develops a competency in terms of dealing with stakeholders and uh, develops strategies for the future. We need to be continuously doing that to remain accountable to the people of Botswana at all times. Um, I earlier mentioned that uh, the change that Botswana is planning in terms of diversification involves trade-offs. Not only we need a communication strategy and engagement with stakeholders on the actual change that is happening, but also explaining very clearly what are the trade-offs. Because if the people don't understand it, today they may like your strategy, but once the trade-off is on the table, they may say we actually preferred when it was different, when it was the past. You know, so it's very important to take that into cognizance uh, that the trade-off, and there are many trade-offs in terms of diversification. And so it's important to recognize that and uh, put the communication strategy Thank on you. it. Cuts, cuts on Bruce, I'm gonna give you a minute each if I could just, uh, there we go. Um, thank you very much. Um, they have said it all, but the competitiveness, we, is that luck, the type of the, 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 what they used to, to, like GDP per capita, is a very crude measure, looking at the size of the population. So you might find that when we're interpreting um, our, our level of either competitiveness or where we belong in the world ranking, 
we had to be cognizant of the fact that we are using a very crude measure. So that, that's very, very important. Thank you. Bruce. I thought there was a tremendous amount in, in all of that, um, Jonathan, particularly some of the things Dr. Kitakilwe and Dorothy said. I think what I take from this is that there's a tremendous opportunity involving the, the future and the youth in Botswana, but clearly a tremendous risk if policy isn't delivered and tremendous focus needs to be put on actually implementation of strategy, not just designing strategy. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in what's been said. You know, maybe um, this point that mineral policy is not terribly well understood, um, we need to think harder about how the future stakeholders, who may be on today's stakeholders, uh, what they want to hear. Are we transparent enough? I think that's something we will need to look at. How do we deliver the message? Well, there are very different platforms today than there were even five years ago. So I think there's a tremendous amount in that for all of us to think about um, going forward into the future, but I think we should all be very conscious that today's stakeholder is not necessarily tomorrow's stakeholder. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there were some sort of key questions that hopefully we will carry on uh, into the discussions the rest of the day. Um, but in the meantime, if you, if you would please join me in thanking the panelists for their uh, great insights and, uh, and